to start by just thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today. It's, um, I'm actually a fourth year medical student at the University of Cincinnati and to speak to all of the experts in this field is a really exciting opportunity for me. Um, this work I, I did as part of my research here, as part of the uh, Medical Research Scholars Program, and this is the, their acknowledgement statement about our funding. So fibrous dysplasia is a, a, a disease of a rare bone disease that results from postzygotic mutations in the gene GNAS. And GNAS encodes the alpha subunit of um, the stimulatory G protein. And so NFD mutations in um, GS alpha result in constitutive ligand independent receptor activation and subsequently inappropriate cyclic AMP. Sorry about that. Can you do this better? Yeah. Um, and so, and subsequently, you have um, inappropriate cyclic AMP mediated signaling. And in osteoprogenitor cells, this really um, disrupts in differentiation. And um, so these abnormal bone marrow stromal cells go on to proliferate and they produce a, um, a immature woven bone and they um, excrete a, um, a fibrotic matrix and that result in these kind of expansile discrete um, fibroosseous lesions. And fibrous dysplasia presents along a very uh, broad phenotypic spectrum. Um, and so you can have monostotic lesions that only affect one bone and that are really trivial and diagnosed um, incidentally on imaging to um, widespread debilitating polyostotic disease that can affect any um, combination of the appendicular, craniofacial, or axial skeleton. And so this phenotypic variation um, is really due to the point during embryogenesis um, when the mutation occurs. So early embryonic mutations result in um, somatic mosaicism, and the FD lesions then reflect the migration of the mutant cells. But if the um, mutation occurs early enough during embryogenesis, prior to gastrulation and prior to the formation of the trilaminar disc, you can get um, involvement of all three germ layers. And this is what we call McCune-Albright syndrome, or MAS. And so in McCune-Albright syndrome, you have um, lesions, the FD lesions of the bone that arise from the mesoderm, as well as findings in the skin um, and the endocrine organs arising from the ectoderm and the endoderm, respectively. And so if you recall, there are several of the hypothalamic pituitary axis hormones that um, signal through these G-protein coupled receptors. Um, they're listed here. And then when you have a uh, mutation that causes the constitutive activation of these um, target tissues, you get um, overproduction of their downstream products. And so clinically, we observe cafe au lait macules of the skin, hyperthyroidism, precocious puberty, growth hormone excess, and neonatal Cushing's. And also, very commonly, we observe rickets, and this is due to overproduction of the hormone FGF23. And so FGF23 is normally made by osteocytes, and it's a potent regulator um, of phosphate and vitamin D metabolism. And so in FD, the mutant cells overproduce this hormone, resulting in renal phosphate wasting um, and hypophosphatemia, as well as vitamin D deficiency. And so at the uh, NIDCR, we're particularly interested in studying um, craniofacial FD because it can cause severe morbidity in this patient population. And a lot of these complications have been really well described. So um, and they include uh, nasal and sinus obstruction, malocclusion, hearing impairment, facial asymmetry, and visual changes. However, cranial-based deformities have not previously been recognized as a feature of the disease. And we really um, started to be, first became interested in studying the, um, the cranial-based deformities in this population when we saw this patient and subsequently um, other patients that are similar. And so this patient presented to the NIH Clinical Center. Um, he had very widespread, severe uh, polyosotic fibrous dysplasia, and his complaint was difficulty swallowing. Um, he had dysphagia for six weeks, um, numbness of his arms that worsened with coughing, and intermittent posterior neck um, and head pain. He had, his past medical history was significant in that his um, McCune Albright syndrome related endocrinopathies were really poorly managed. So he had, um, he went, he had precocious puberty and untreated hyperthyroidism as well as um, hypophosphatemia. And his physical exam, he had a decreased um, sensation in both his face and his arms and a loss of gag reflex. 
And so on his imaging, it revealed some severe um, distortion of the cranial base. He had basilar invagination, as well as a Chiari malformation with a uh, syrinx. And he also had a large um, aneurysmal bone cyst in his occipital bone. So um, an aneurysmal bone cyst is a rare complication of fibrous dysplasia in which you have formation of these kind of cystic vascular lesions um, arising within the FD. And so this is really more for me than for you, because when I was first starting this um, project, I, I found that the nomenclature was kind of confusing. Sometimes they use basilar invagination versus basilar impression, and basilar impression and platabasia sometimes were used interchangeably. But um, for this talk, at least, I'm going to use just basilar invagination um, specified either as primary or secondary uh, platabasia for skull base flattening, and then cranial settling really just to describe disruption of the craniovertebral junction due to either the weak bone or ligament laxity. And so basilar invagination, um, secondary, or acquired basilar invagination arise secondary to traumatic change or bone softening. And it's associated with several metabolic bone disorders, including Paget's disease, osteomalacia, hyperpara, um, and severe osteoporosis. And similarly, Chiari 1 malformations are also associated with metabolic and structural bone disorders. However, of course, like our uh, previous speaker mentioned, that you know, different, there are different mechanisms for these different diseases. So um, in metabolic and structural bone disease, one is um, the idea of cranial settling, in which you either have a defect, an inherent defect of the matrix or um, increased turnover or decreased mineralization that causes structurally weak bone um, that deforms. Um, under weight-bearing forces. And you can also see in um, bony disorders of overgrowth, um, cranial constriction as a cause of, you know, a decreased posterior fossa volume resulting in tonsillar herniation. And then I also would like to point out the, um, the idea of increased cranial pressure causing a Chiari. And I've, although there aren't any uh, primary bone disorders listed here in this chart, uh, I think it's important to recognize in, in any sort of potential cranial mass and so FD, MAS is a, a complex disorder, and so there are several potential mechanisms at play here. So first we have the cranial um, settling, which can be worsened by the endocrinopathies associated with MAS, uh, hypophosphatemia, rickets, and even hyperthyroidism. Um, also cranial constriction, which could be due to the just widespread FD expansion of the craniofacial region, and also once again worsened by uh, acromegaly or the growth hormone excess observed in this disease. And then finally, we, we do see some discrete mass lesions uh, if you have an aggressive localized expansion of FD um, in this image or an um, a aneurysmal bone cyst. And so we really wanted to answer um, these questions because of the significant morbidity that is associated with these uh, cranial-based deformities. And so we wanted to know what are the causal mechanisms of Chiari in craniofacial FD, and what, are the role, what, are the, what is the role of the MAS-related endocrinopathies? And we, um, in June, we published our findings from um, this study, and I'm going to be sharing some of the data from that study with you today. So the goals of the study were to determine the prevalence and the natural history of cranial-based deformities in FD, examine the cranial morphology to determine the causal mechanisms of Chiari in this population, and to identify any risk factors. So patients from the long-standing natural history study of uh, FD-MAS at the NIH were included in this study. And we included all patients who had previously had a CT scan with less than five millimeter axial slices. Um, and so that gave us 171 patients, of which 158 actually had craniofacial FD, and um, 13 had no craniofacial involvement. But because, of, of course, like we've been, I've been talking about, the endocrinopathies that could affect um, bone turnover, we had to, these patients still could have systemic effects of um, those endocrinopathies, so we also had um, 10 normal controls. And so we did a cranial morphometric and a volumetric evaluation of the, crani of the posterior fossa. Um, we were able to do a longitudinal analysis um, of 90 patients who had serial CT scans and review the clinical records and imaging reports for um, possible risk factors. And so 
no, typically, I know that the uh, diagnosis is made on MRI, but of Chiari malformation, but CT is better for visualizing um, the bony structures. And all 171 of our patients had previous CTs, but only 93 had um, MRIs. And so we decided to do the study using the CT scans. And so in order to validate this, we um, compared concurrent MRI and CT scans from 56 patients. And you can see in this graph that there was good uh, correlation, and then the Spearman correlation coefficient was 0.9 and the regression coefficient 0.93. And so for our craniomorphometric evaluation, we had nine linear and angular um, measurements that we did, and we, we did this in accordance to the um, neurologic, uh, the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke uh, common data elements. And so we, um, as part of the, the measurements, we also measured tonsillar position to diagnose Chiari and, of course, odontoid position to diagnose a basal invagination. And we used the definition of greater than five millimeters below McRae's line or the frame and magnum margin for um, Chiari and greater than five millimeters above Chamberlain's line for the diagnosis of basal invagination. And so these are the measurements we um, looked at, and we were looking at these various length um, and volume to, to look for cranial constriction, and then disruption of these uh, changes in these angles for looking for cranial settling. And so we did find that there was an increased prevalence of both Chiari malformation and basal invagination in FD um, of, I guess, 6.3 and 7.6 percent, respectively. And we didn't find either abnormality in either our patients who had FD but no craniofacial involvement or in our normal controls. Um, and I think it's important to note that these patients were symptomatic. However, it's, the patients with craniofacial FD um, often complain of a lot of these symptoms just that are common for, uh, that we don't really know but could be due to the FD. But there were also symptoms that are really uncommonly reported in FD um, that were, and signs that were less likely to be due to their FD alone. And so the craniomorphometric um, Findings in subjects with basilar invagination were compared to then subjects who had craniofacial FD without basilar invagination, subjects who had no craniofacial involvement, and then to the normal controls. And these were um, significant, these measures highlighted in yellow were the significant differences amongst all three groups. And so you can see that the patients with basilar invagination had decreased frame and magnum length, an increase in Bugard's angle, and a decrease in tentorial angle. And I think together these. Um, finding support that basal invagination in this population is also associated with uh, skull base flattening. Um, for first, the increase in Bugard's angle is a measure of posterior skull base flattening. Um, I think the decrease in tentorial angle is likely due to um, infolding of the margins of the frame and magnum, which is a phenomenon that's really commonly reported in osteogenesis imperfecta, which is thought to be due to kind of micro fractures in the skull base. And then finally, um, the decrease in frame and magnum length, possibly due to the horizontalization of the clivus. And then we did a similar analysis in the patients who had Chiari malformations compared to the same kind of three groups. And the yellow, again, is the uh, significantly different measurements. And they had a decreased frame and magnum length as well as decreased posterior craniofossal volume. And then they had an increase in Bugard's angle and an increase in odontoid position. And in fact, three of the patients with Chiari's had um, also had basilar invagination. And so these findings suggest that both cranial constriction and cranial um, settling contribute to the development of Chiari in the FD population. Um, the decreased frame and magnum length and the decreased posterior fossa volume supporting cranial constriction and the increase in odontoid position and increase in Bugard's angle supporting evidence of cranial settling. And then we weren't able to look at this statistically because we didn't actually have any um, lumbar puncture data on these patients, but we did find uh, there were some findings that could um, suggest that increased intracranial pressure may also um, cause uh, um, Chiari's in this population. So we had patients who had papilledema on um, OCT and on physical exam, and then we had several patients who had evidence of mass effect on their um, on their imaging, as well as we saw mass lesions, including um, bone cysts and arachnoid cysts. We were able to identify risk factors for both Chiari malformation and basal invagination. So both of these deformities were um, 
associated with scoliosis. Um, basilar invagination was associated with hypophosphatemia and hyperthyroidism, which are both endocrinopathies that, um, that contribute to bone metabolism. And then basilar invagination was also uh, related to precocious, associated with precocious puberty, which one hypothesis for what could be going on here is that if you have early closure of this uh, cranial base synchondroses, that perhaps that this distorts the cranial uh, posterior fossa morphology. Um, in addition, these patients also had increased what we call skeletal disease burden. So the skeletal disease burden score is a uh, validated tool to uh, estimate the amount of bone disease in this very heterogeneous um, patient population. And this is done on bone scintigraphy scans. And so here you can see that both the uh, patients who had Chiari and who had basal invagination um, were significantly more likely to have increased skeletal uh, involvement. And finally, we um, did a um, longitudinal analysis, and we found that tonsillar position did not significantly change with age, but we did see that odontoid position did progress with age, um, with the greatest rate of change occurring in childhood and adolescence. And so this graph really just shows the raw data, and um, each line is a patient with their first and last um, odontoid position measurement on CT scans. And um, the blue line represents the predicted values from our uh, mixed model analysis. So we were able to model this data um, and the kind of uh, effects are listed in the table. So the um, mean progression rate was 0.23 millimeters per year. And this uh, progression rate tended to decrease with age. And then also we found that out of all of the endocrinopathies and other associations with uh, fibrous dysplasia, only skeletal uh, disease burden had effect on progression. And so in conclusion, there is an increased prevalence of Chiari malformation and basilar invagination in fibrous dysplasia McCune Albright syndrome. Um, potential mechanisms for developing a Chiari uh, include cranial settling, cranial constriction, and intracranial hypertension. And um, endocrinopathies associated with fibrous dysplasia McCune Albright syndrome contribute to the development of these deformities. And the clinical implications are that you know patients who have cranial FD uh, should be screened for these. And actually, um, at the um, American Society of Bone and Mineral Research meeting that was just last week, I think that we finally came up with the consensus guidelines. And um, Allison Boyce did get the uh, this guideline in those included it in those guidelines, which is pretty exciting. Um, and. I think another clinical uh, implication is that you, every, all the patients should get a uh, radiographic evaluation of the cranial base dimensions and go uh, undergo monitoring and aggressive treatment for their associated endocrinopathies. And with that, I would just like to thank um, my mentor at the uh, National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, uh, Michael Collins, who has invited me to stay at the NIH for a second year to continue my research with him, as well as our collaborator, uh, collaborator Dr. Heiss, and my um, other mentor, Allison Boyce, and the rest of our lab. So with that, thanks.